Have you noticed how every time Gant introduces somebody with a non-traditional surname, he always just like ends at the, at, the, at the first name? But but he starts with this intonation, this kind of inflection. It's almost like he's going to say the last name, but then he just doesn't have the balls to kind of, you know, like <laughs> continue. Um, wow. Uh, final speaker of a conference. This is uh, pretty, it's an honor. Uh, I, I personally think it's because I keep calling Jamin Hamon, and uh, he's punishing me for it. Anyway, so, so I, I thought really hard, it's like, you know, two days of great content, what hasn't been said? What can I tell you um, that is, you know, something that I'm in a good position to speak of, uh, but also that is generally interesting and useful to you? And hopefully it should be something that leaves you inspired and excited and, you know, willing to, you know, fork that, you know, few hundred bucks to come back next year, right? So I thought it was really hard, and, and then I got it. I got it. Um, I really want to just want to talk to you about you know Western art, uh, specifically you know Renaissance and like onwards because that's what I studied at school. So let, let's go with that. Uh, this is uh, a drawing by Leonardo da Vinci uh, from the 1500s. It's a uh, it's an anatomically correct study of a fetus in a womb. Um, what I find fascinating about this this drawing is that at that time like there weren't really like medical textbooks. Like he basically needed to. You know, as sad as it is, he needed to look at like real human cadavers in order to figure out um, how to how to draw this. Um, around the same time, Michelangelo painted, you know, this uh, creation of Adam, uh, which you know everybody knows is at the in the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And you know, this is like has similar kind of like composition. You know, like you instead of having that you know baby in a womb, you have you know the heavens and earth, uh, heavens and God, uh, presented in this in this kind of you know image of the human brain. What I find interesting about this, though, is that Michelangelo uses this technique called secco fresco, which basically had him mixing eggplant, uh, sorry, uh, egg yolks with, uh, with pigments and trying to get that to stick to a ceiling. Um, I, I'm not kidding. This goes on. It's like half an hour, so. <laughs> uh, Danae by, uh, by Rembrandt uh, is one of my favorite pieces of um, uh, uh, works of art. Uh, what I particularly like about Rembrandt's work is the, is the kind of the light that it captures. Um, it's this like extreme sort of realism um, within it. And it's a, it's a very distinctive quality about his work and something that he worked for really hard for his entire life to achieve. Um, this one is The Bathers by Cezanne. Um, you know, this is moving a couple hundred years forward. Um, it's like post-impressionism. Um, but what you can tell there is that, you know, like the, 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 the level of realism has really, you know, gone down, but there is something psychologically a lot more evocative about this piece. Um, and then moving forward a little bit, um, this is a picture of Morgan Freeman. Um, it was painted by some guy called Kyle, and he did it, you know, with a finger on an iPad. Um, and, you know, this is called photorealistic digital painting. Anyway, you... <laughs> at this point, some of you, uh, the uneducated of you, might be wondering, uh, well, <laughs> what, what am I talking about? Um, let me explain. Uh, my name is Yanni Evakallio, and that's how you say it again. Um, I'm, I'm, I work at Formidable Labs. You've already heard about our company from Jen Luker, who spoke yesterday, and, and from Kyle, who hosted the panel today, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, but it's, it's been really great this year, um, coming back to this conference and seeing so many people coming from the mobile development background. Um, because I, I personally, I come from web development background, and it's really great to see that, you know, this technology is going mainstream. It's becoming, um, it's becoming something that, you know, it's not only for web developers, it's for anybody wanting to build a mobile app. Um, what attracted me, though, to, to React Native is this idea of learn once, write everywhere, which we, which we all know. Um, but the more I work with mobile applications, um, it, you know, I'm becoming to doubt whether or not this is actually um, an accurate, you know, representation. Like Jen said yesterday, uh, today in the panel, it's basically a lie, right? Um, so the reason I, I, I showed you those pieces of art is that I'm going to be using them as a metaphor for some of the things that we do. Um, and to begin with, I, I believe that, you know, the idea of learn once and write everywhere is roughly analogous to the idea of taking one of these painters um, and have them reproduce the work of art in another style, right? Like, obviously, in the same way as if you know how to program in one language, it's easier for you to learn to program in another. One of these painters could have, you know, like, learned the tools and techniques of another, um, but, you know, it wouldn't have been um, automatic or easy. If you give Rembrandt an iPad and tell him to, you know, make a picture of Morgan Freeman, he doesn't even know how to use the device, right? Um, so, start with this, the studies of a fetus um, in a womb. 
uh, to me, like this is very much like what web development really is. It's, it's, it's the study of form, a study of structure um, to create like a lifelike experience. Uh, it's like sometimes to me, like web development, it feels like you're basically like digging into a cadaver and like trying to figure out like how, you know, how to make it work, right? Um, it's, it's an act of invention, it's an act of like research and study. There's no universal guidelines, there's no standard implementations of anything, it's all up to you. Um, mobile development, I think, is a lot more like this picture of Morgan Freeman. Um, there's this certain kind of attention to detail that the user expects. Um, the platforms have historically been able to produce better performance, you know, and users have grown to expect it. Um, and they also expect that when they switch between, you switch, with, they sp we switch between apps on your phone, um, that these things kind of behave in a, in a consistent manner because um, there are these guidelines for it. And you know, it's kind of like the uncanny valley. Like if you're doing things not just right, you know, it's it immediately, um, immediately clear that you know, a picture of Morgan Freeman might not look quite right. Um, and so creation of Adam, to me, you know, this is just a representation of, of this platform. Um, design guidelines, it's the great, you know, tool makers of the, from the sky, you know, the gods at, at Apple and, and, and Google, um, giving us these tools and giving us these guidelines, right? Oh, I wasn't expecting a laugh on that, thanks. Um, <laughs> um, and, and then Dana then. Um, these, these design principles that I'm talking about, they're kind of like laws of physics. Like what if Rembrandt, while painting this picture, instead of like diligently studying, um, you know, like physical reality, and you know, trying to create this effect of light, it's just what, what, like, fuck it, I'm just gonna put a lens flare here. Uh, <laughs> like, like do, do, do you think that this piece would be a masterpiece? Um, I, I don't think so. And, and I think this is exactly where this you know, idea of, of, of learn once, right everywhere kind of gets you. Like, yes, you know, you know React, and you're learning React Native, so you know like, some of the things, um, but you know, we as developers, we're so hungry for easy solutions and to broaden our reach, and, be able to increase our value to our employers and all that kind of stuff. So we want to buy into these, you know, fictions. Um, it's not React Native's fault, really. It's not bad marketing, I don't think. It's just, you know, it's so convenient to us that we want to believe in it. So, uh, everybody seen this? Uh, how, how do you do it? Like, how do you get from the point that, you know, like you're a React web developer and you get to the, you know, uh, get, to, get to be, uh, you know, a React Native mobile developer? Um, there's a lot of details, I could go into them. Instead, I'm just gonna refer to you to a, a talk that uh, Alex Kotliarski gave it last year, um, right here on this stage. Uh, it's called Building Stellar User Experiences with React Native, and it just does like a phenomenal job of describing what great mobile interfaces are made of, and you know, how to build them in React Native, and all that kind of stuff. Um, instead, I wanna you know, talk about something that he left out. Um, I think it's the biggest unsolved problem. It's not. You know, the biggest unsolved problem isn't fabric or synchronous rendering or anything like that kind of stuff. I think the biggest React Native development challenge right now is capitalism. Um, and you know, I, I, I think it's like the, one of the biggest challenges that we have in the world right now. I mean, you as American audience might disagree with me, but you know, there we go. Um, so in this perfect, oh yeah, come on, pity socialism. Um, <laughs> Uh, so in this perfect world, we could basically, you know, spend our lifetimes getting the light just right. Uh, we could study books, you know, we could study the works of masters, we could learn about it, but in practice, we're building software in the system where we have a lot of constraints of production, right? We need to, um, we need to stick to timelines, we need to stick to budget, um, and this is setting constraints for the kind of work that we can do. And this is, of course, true of all software, um, but I'm starting to think that the React Native community itself is, is particularly badly affected by this. And the reason for that is that, you know, at Formidable, when we talk to a lot of different, you know, companies, whether they're big or small, um, they come to React Native with this, with this idea um, that they think that they're gonna get, which is, I wonder if this is something that, you know, that can help us to make software quicker and cheaper. And, you know, that's not a bad goal as such, um, but, you know, like, when that is your motivation for adopting a technology at a, even, like, organizational level, then that kind of bleeds into your general working practices and your decision-making um, abilities. It's almost like a self-selection kind of thing. So, so the question is, can you? Can you make it cheaper? Every, everybody here knows that if you want to make like a Swift app and a Kotlin app, um, that's going to be more code, and therefore, you know, React Native is probably going to be, you know, better or like, you know, faster. Um, but I don't know. So, so, so the motivation of efficiency also has like a lot of like really um, sort of like unintentionally harmful consequences. Because you know, when tooling promises efficiency, the goal becomes efficiency. Um, 
uh, you forget the one question that I think you should ask. It's not cheaper, it's, you know, you want better. Um, so better than what? Better than native mobile apps? Well, I don't know, let's see. So, so you know, using, you know, these great tools that we have to create, you know, like more maintainable, more reason aboutable software, you know, like we can make it less buggy, um, that's great. Um, so yeah, in those regards, I think React Native is like a great technology. But can we actually make a better user experience in React Native? I, I don't think so. Like if this is the goal that you set for yourself, um, you know, if, if you want to create a native user experience, given enough time um, and enough, enough resources, a team, you know, working in Swift and Kotlin can always create a better app if this is the beauty standard or the standard, you know, that you set for yourself. Because you know, there's always going to be cost. There's a startup time cost, render perf costs. Um, you're using uh, JavaScript recreations of native UI, um, I, you know, components. So you know, this is the reality. Like, it's basically like if 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 Morgan Freeman was standing here with me right now. Like, there's no way that you can paint a picture of Morgan Freeman that is more Morgan Freeman than Morgan Freeman. Like, like that that, that is just not an achievable goal. So what's the goal? Um, can can we create applications that are good enough? Um, can we find a like acceptable compromise um, while still delivering you know apps that are good enough? So in the past, like many 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 tools and technologies have tried this. Um, you know, like I've I've tried them all, like Xamarin, Forms, uh, Cordova, uh, like Trevor today referred to as a trash fire, I believe. Um, and and you know I agree. Like with anything else that I've tried before, it's either impossible or pointlessly hard to create um, good enough UX with these tools. Um, but having built you know you know, half a dozen apps now and, and leading a team that has built dozens of React Native apps, I can definitely see that you can create um, apps that are good enough. But it doesn't come for free, and this is kind of what I, what I really want to talk about. Um, these tools, they can help us fall into a bit of success, but it depends on you to make it so. And if we want React Native as a technology to succeed, not to be remembered as the trash fire of 2018, um, we need to make sure that we create apps that are great. Um, otherwise, it'll be dismissed just like PhoneGap or, or whatever. I think the best example of this mentality to me is, is Adam Miskovich or Skevi, who, who worked at Expo and then at, at Airbnb. Um, so he was working on React Navigation, and he noticed that there's this transition animation that doesn't look quite right. It doesn't look quite like iOS um, does. Uh, let me just like, read you this paragraph, because I think this is like, one of the best PRs I've ever seen in my life. Um, after doing some research, I ended up disassembling the Quartz Core framework, reading the assembly, and determined that Apple's implementation of CA Spring Animation does not use an integrated numerical animation model as we do in Animated Spring, but instead solve for the closed form of the equations that govern damped harmonic oscillations. Um, oh no, oh no, I spoiled that one. Um, and then he went and he re-implemented that in Animated so that it could end up in, um, in, in React Navigation. So I don't think that that falls in the category of learn once, right, uh, right everywhere. Like if you are reading that in documentation and you want to try this technology um, and you want to have high UX standards, I don't think that can be described as like, you know, like you've decided that you want to build your app in React Native and you know, you're kind of like going to your boss hat in hand, going like, yeah, sorry boss, I, I told you that this navigation story would be like one point, so like two days. But you know, I've been reading this assembly for like a week, and I've like no, no idea what's going on. Uh, so, sorry. Uh, I broke my slides. Anyway, so the thing is that the obvious difference between like some organizations and others uh, is. <laughs> so a lot of '90s kids in here today. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the difference is that the amount that you are um, able to invest in things like user experience, like tooling, um, it's highly probable that you have to work in an environment that has different constraints from others. And it's like not, not like Facebook doesn't have constraints either, but you know, like it's, it's a different amount of zeros at the end of it. Uh, so, but this is not an excuse to give up. And this is where we rejoin uh, my, my announced title, good enough still isn't good enough. And I say still because I've given a similar presentation before at React Native EU um, last year. Some of you might have, might have seen this. And up until this point, this presentation has been very similar. Um, but back then, I spent the second half of this focusing on how to build collaborative engineering culture 
uh, where basically management and design and development kind of work together um, to, you know, like, you know, like in a, in a very grown up sense. Um, but, you know, like being the, the final speaker um, today, I, I felt that that was a bit sort of like boring and sleep inducing. So that's not the story I want to tell today, but there, there is another story. Um, and this is a story that is motivated by something that's happened to me, like in, in you know, my personal life as a, as a general citizen of the world um, in the last year. And it's, it's like, I don't know, probably many of you know this, but the world doesn't really seem like the same place as it was, um, as it was last year. Like, like everything has, has kind of like gone a bit fucked up. Um, and, and it started with politics, but it, it's affected my general outlook in life, I just can't believe in centrism anymore. Like I can't, it's not a viable strategy in life. I can't be here, um, you know, like talking to you about like how to, how to, you know, like compromise and how to, you know, like sort of do this. Um, because here's the thing, if the other side is pulling really hard to their direction, then you need to pull back in equal or greater force um, in order to counterbalance that, right? Compromises are outcomes, they're not goals. It's your job. It's not your job to do your comprom their compromising you know, for them, right? Like they pull, you pull, and compromise is what happens when two you know, forces find an equilibrium. So you, you could say that I've, I've become somewhat radicalized in my, in my you know, like general sort of thinking. Um, and and you know, to bring this back into software development, I think our job as software developers is to build great software. As React Native developers, our job is to build great user interfaces. That feels like a statement that should go without saying, but I don't think it is. At these technical conferences, um, you know, we focus so much on, on, on you know, code organization and techniques and frameworks and, and state management and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, like, and those are great and they're gonna help us get to our goals, but we shouldn't forget that the end goal of React, um, the tagline of React, is that it's a library for building user interfaces and our job is to build those user interfaces. So I call this, um, this segment, uh, writing React Native apps like an artist, um, mainly because I really needed to have an excuse to get you know get you to watch me talk five minutes about like those pieces of art. Um, but but I, I I really think that you know like you know looking at you know like talking about some of these things and you thinking about them, I can guarantee you that there's not going to be a single thing that you can take to work on Monday and go like ah now I know how to do that. But I hope that there will be some things that you will take away from this in a way that has you know like maybe will affect your general way that you approach building software and building user interfaces. So let's go. I think the first thing um, is that it's really easy to confuse the tools and techniques that artists use and that we use uh, between what we call the art itself or the product itself. Um, when we go to conferences, we speak about developer experiences, uh, but it, it's kind of like useful thing to remember that nobody cares about the developer experience except developers themselves, right? Like we are already the most overpaid, cushy sort of like class in the society. And then we go in conferences and we talk about how we wanna have a great experience, right? <laughs> like like there, there's some rich irony in there. Uh, thank you. Um, but our overlords will allow this because they know that it's just coded speech for productivity. It just basically us saying that we want better developer experiences that you know they think, oh yeah, because that's gonna basically turn these very expons expensive human resources into you know better production units. Um, but the subversive subversive power move here is that we take that developer experience and we take that added productivity. Um, and we turn it into better product experiences, better user experiences, not into quicker turnarounds or you know, some other goals. All of those things kind of go hand to hand and compromises will be made, but this is not our goal. Our goal is the product. Secondly, art, in order to be in any way meaningful, needs to be immediate, and it needs to be free of irony, and needs to be free of detachment. Um, you have to start from a point of truly deeply caring. In order to find, you know, like fight for these user experiences, fight, fight these battles, um, you need to care. It's not like global warming. You can't just pretend to care. It's, you know, it's like, it, it's, it's a real thing. <laughs> sorry. Um, sorry. Um, so what this means in practice is putting the user experience in forefront. Um, you know, like fighting, you know, sweating those little details, um, you know, just, just generally 
uh, taking an, an approach into any interaction, um, any product decision, is that this is, you know, this is, this is, this is our goal. Um, no matter how much you care, though, in order to be effective, um, you need to have a baseline of knowledge uh, and understanding that what constitutes user experience. So this is the thing that you know, happens between the first step of drawing the owl and the, you know, the second step of drawing the owl. And I think a great place for this generally to understand the laws um, that you know, govern the user experience that we seek are the Google material design guidelines and the Apple human interface guidelines. How many people here have actually read those things? All right, that's a good number, not everybody. Uh, the rest of you all have some study to do. Um, and, and beyond these guidelines, everything that we know about user experience, everything we know about how humans interact with computers or with phones is a result of experimentation and research. And a lot of this research is actually published on the internet in journals and blogs for completely free. So, you know, like, and this is general knowledge. This is generally useful knowledge that, you know, will translate to any um, software. So this is mandatory reading, people. Um, next thing is understanding your, your particular medium. Um, if you're building for iOS and Android, you need to have an intuitive understanding of how those platforms actually work. Um, and there's an easy solution for that. There's a really, really simple solution for that. Um, and it costs, you know, about a thousand bucks and you're not gonna like it. Um, but it's whichever mobile platform you're using today, start using the other one. Like, I know that there's a lot of, like, you know, sort of tribalism around iOS versus Android users. Uh, but if you don't live the experience of having, you know, actually used the, uh, the, the, the platforms that you're building for, you don't know what's right. You don't know what Morgan Freeman looks like, so to speak. Um, so yeah, uh, sorry about that, but you'll have to go and buy a phone. The, the next thing is to study the work of, of other masters. Um, this is very simple. Um, the best way that no matter like what your budget is in terms of like what your design team looks like, what your role in the organization is, um, the best way to get great ideas is to steal them. Um, it, it, it's that simple. And it's not about copying instead of being creative. Um, it's about copying things that work because they work. Um, you know, like if you take the pull to refresh, right? Like that was not a part of any platform guideline. That was something that Tweedy made, um, you know, before they got bought at Twitter. And now today, if the user basically has a list view and they drag it down, and if it doesn't refresh the list, they will be frustrated because that's the thing that they expect. And in order for you to know that, you need to, uh, you need to know how apps work. Um, next, I think, you know, I wanna talk a bit about, um, you know, the sort of like creativity um, and aesthetic. I said earlier that React Native cannot fully uh, replicate native experience. I believe, fundamentally believe this to be true and you can disagree and feel, feel, feel free to at me on Twitter. But it's also an incomplete truth. There, there, there is you know, this view layer that we have in React Native that's actually instead of limiting, it's freeing and it's enabling. Um, as long as we conform to those platform usability standards, accessibility standards like Jen talked about, um, we have the ability to be a lot more creative because we essentially have a custom drawing you know, framework in our use that we can do basically, you know, a lot of things that we want. And if you can't do it that, there's this GL. So, you know, like, go wild, right? Um, so I think instead of like trying to painstakingly uh, replicate that Morgan Freeman, I think it's about like finding, um, you know, finding the kind of like expression that you're looking for. Um, I don't know, have courage to stand out is like what, I'm get, what I'm saying. And one point that I haven't made yet, which is probably something that is implicitly goes through everything that I've said today, but is not universally agreed, is that I believe that software development and user experience design are not two separate fields. Uh, some of us are able to code, so that's great. Some of us are able to create um, beautiful visual art, like the design team that made this amazing branding for this conference. Uh, some people are able to do both. Um, but no matter what your job title is, we all share the objective of, of being able to create experiences that are useful, um, that are usable, and that are delightful. So whatever your strengths are, I think you need to kind of take that and apply that um, you know, with creativity. If, if you have eye for the visual, even if you're not on the design team and you have somebody you know, like pushing you know, sketches or Photoshop or Zeppelins at you, um, there is a kind of area um, in which you know that those designs are not gonna be complete. You know those empty states are not gonna be designed and you know, loading states are not gonna be designed and things are really hard to do and you know, like all those things. And this is what happens when we segregate and separate the unified field of creating user experiences. So, you know, work in that. And if, if you are one of those uh, user interface developers 
that is just like really like, you know, calls themselves poor at design. Well, firstly, I would question your life choices and you're probably just a full stack developer. Um, but also, you know, like there's a lot of really hard mathy things in creating user experience. If you think of animation, um, it's, it's a, like very, very complicated work and it's delightful work for somebody who enjoys doing that because it's localized, it's risk free. You can basically like break your entire app or cause massive technical debt, but you can hack on that, you know, beautiful animation. And then when the boss asks you like how long the feature will take, you'll just tell them like three times what you think and then you'll have time to make that animation. So. Um, th there is one cl classical quality of an artist that we don't want to replicate. I'm just get that out of the way. Is, is that, you know, I, I talk here with fighting words. I, I, I'm here, you know, like basically trying to radicalize a bunch of people. Like I think, you know, there might be, you know, some kind of government agency outside right now with helicopters um, coming to take me away. Um, but th this is the thing, like don't be an asshole. Like creative geniuses have, historically speaking, you know, been given a lot of leeway. But that's not what I'm advocating, and that's definitely not, you know, 2018. Um, in order to fight for this and advocate for this, you shouldn't be uncollaborative. Like, there's definitely a sweet spot between happy-go-lucky and happy-go-fuck yourself or whatever. Like, it's, it, you know, like, you, you can actually do these things in a, in a kind of, like, creative collaborative matter and also respect everybody no matter, like, what their skill set or what their, you know, particular field of expertise is. That said, um, the key message that I'll spend the rest of the time talking about is the don't stop at the good enough. So do you remember this painting um, by the bathers, uh, by Suzanne? Um, I, I saw this ad in the London National Gallery um, and it immediately caught my eye. Uh, I mean, it's very large also, but you know, that probably helped. Um, but you know, like there was something about it that I couldn't quite take my eyes off of. And I was thinking, what makes this thing a masterpiece? Um, there's this odd atmosphere here, at the same time it's very strange, it's very beautiful. Um, there's, in this composition, there's this kind of tension and density and symmetry that is then intentionally broken. Um, but the thing about Cezanne's bathers is that it took a remarkable process of perfecting over time of not being satisfied in the good enough. Um, because before he painted this, he painted, you know, a few other bathers, and he painted more of them, and he painted more of them, and he painted more of them. Uh, this is, this is, you know, a, a kind of process of, of iteration that, you know, I, you would say that gets any individual to the point of mastery uh, and being able to, you know, create great things. Um, we know that we need to ship things. You know, that's where the compromise comes in. You know, in an ideal world, we would never ship anything because there's no users and there's no bug reports and there's no pager duty and, you know, like, it, it, it's great. Um, but you know, we need to ship things, but you know, we sh still shouldn't settle for the good enough. Uh, React Native as a technology is perfect for this. All the things that we've explored at this conference, um, Kent's uh, component patterns, uh, Samantha's talk about component libraries, um, the fact that we're writing a single code base um, instead of multiple ones, it makes this platform perfect for uh, change and evol evolution over time. So you know, with these tools to support incremental improvement, um, I think we can actually create better products in React Native over time that it won't be seen as just the good enough solution to create, you know, random average line of business apps. Because, you know, like everybody is competing in the same um, capitalist sort of field of enterprise. And, you know, you and uh, I and, you know, all of us, you know, like using these technologies, we have the advantage of actually not just like making a thing, uh, we have an advantage of, of keeping um, and iterating on it. So I think there is as an opportunity for us to make React Native the best technology, but we're all responsible for making that happen. Um, I think React Native in the next couple of years, it will need its billion dollar app. And of course, some of that stuff comes from the evil business owner who is putting like, you know, like schedules and, and budgets on you. But you know, like some of it will have to come also from the, from the user experience. Because if you look at the billion dollar businesses that are in the mobile consumer space, they all share one thing, which is that they're generally amazing products. So I'm gonna leave you with this. Um, it's a thing that I found on the internet um, that Michelangelo supposedly said. I don't think he said anything like this ever because he lived like 500 years ago and this seems like a very random um, thing to attribute to the person. But this really conveniently closes the uh, narrative for me so I'm just gonna go there anyway. Um, which is that you know, the greatest danger for most of us is not that you know, we aim too um, high and we miss it, but it's that we aim too low and we reach it. Um, so, so I guess what I'm trying to say here is, 
you know, resist the efficiency narrative. Efficiency is good, it allows us to do more with less, uh, makes this company more, uh, you know, competitive. But focusing on efficiency instead of on products, it fundamentally is just going to lead into inferior products and, you know, this technology becoming, you know, the, the, the next trash fire that we talk about. So, you know, th th this is it. This is, this is really all I want to say is like, just don't be satisfied with the good enough. And that's why we're all here today. Like all of us are here today because we want to be great at our jobs and our job is to build great products with React Native. Thank you.